One of the standout builds here at the 2022 SEMA show is Ryan's Toyota Stout. And I've watched this come to life on the likes of its Instagram over the last few months. So really nice to see it here in person. We're here with Ryan to get a little bit more of a personal rundown on this build and what it is. So Ryan, great job on this build first, first of all. But let's start with, with the car because, or the truck, uh, in a lot of markets I'm guessing these didn't exist. What exactly is it, what year is it? So it's a 1966 Toyota Stout, uh, definitely a limited run back in the day, when I, obviously when I first came here. I think this was like the first uh, truck that was sold in the US by Toyota when they were still, I believe, called Toya Pet. Okay. Um, double check the, <laughs> the history on that, but we'll, we'll fake check. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long time ago before our time. So, uh, but yeah, that's, and they're, they're getting uh, pretty rare and hard to find. Uh, I found this down in San Diego and, uh, it looked like it was like fully restored, bitching, clean, fresh paint job. But that was actually the problem is, uh, they, they mudded up all the holes in the body and didn't do it properly. So when we got into it, it uh, it was actually a lot took a lot longer than we expected to get this thing cleaned up. So it was uh, previously a bit of a lipstick on a pig renovation restoration. The your typical run of the mill. Let's get this thing looking pretty and, and sell it out the door. Yeah. So you've got a, a fairly uh, elaborate garage of exhibition drift cars, including your Ferrari engine Toyota GT86. You've of course got the Judd V10 powered Supra. What was the inspiration in going with the Stout? It doesn't lend itself on face value to be the most obvious choice for a drift exhibition car. Yeah, I mean, something different. I was approached by TRD and Toyota and Mobile One to do another project in the middle of building the Formula Supra last year. So um, Dominic and I, Dominic who built the majority of the Formula Supra, uh, came up with an idea as he was researching some Toyota vehicles and he said, what about the Stout as a pickup? I was like, that thing looks pretty sick. Um, so that was that was pretty much it. So that we decided to do that. CRD and Mobile One were down. They were they were down with the project, so we went ahead and just started uh, coming up with the build game plan and the strategy for what we were going to do. One of the standouts and most obvious features here is that it is a full tube chassis car. Was that driven because of the problems you found with the Stout, or was this always the way you were going to go? It was at, from so when I was approached halfway through the build on a Formula Supra, uh, Dominic couldn't build this vehicle as well so it had to be subbed out and i always wanted i wanted to i wanted the super to be a tube chassis as well it's just not the way that went so i want to do a tube chassis vehicle in general so that's kind of what uh the road i was going down so i hired kibby tech to do the design work for the tube chassis and then produce uh the or do all the fabrication work on the chassis as well and they are a phenomenal higher end pre-runner off-road shop based in California. So it's kind of a no brainer and I have a relationship with Ryan, the owner already. So it just made sense to have all this happen. Uh, so Dominic and I could finish the Formula Super project together. Now, one of the advantages, I guess, with going with a full tube chassis is you've got complete freedom and where everything's going to mount, you're not confined by or constrained by the existing suspension de design, suspension geometry, which I can imagine on a 66 pickup might not have been the most uh, ideal for drifting. So with so much flexibility, does that give you problems in making decisions? Yeah, yes and no. So the, the only really uh, design issue we had with the truck was designing enough uh, leg room to be comfortable behind the drive, behind the steering wheel. Because the cab is so short and when you, you kind of sit up into it factory wise and your legs are on the steering column in a dashboard. So they had to design so there's a, um, the one side of the vehicle under the hood has uh, the frame the frame very pushed out so you have pedals in there and you can be comfortable in there that was really the that was the biggest design uh, problem to get around besides that everything else is just what do you want to run yeah. you know and I took a page out of Chris Forsberg's book with his Ultimaniac where he ran a double a arm Corvette suspension front and rear it's a simple very awesome suspension design. I, I want, if I could have double A arm on all my cars, I would. So that's why I want to do that for this car. So you weren't essentially starting with a clean sheet of paper. You were, you were basing it around that existing suspension design and, and building everything into the cheap frame to suit it. Yeah, exactly. We, uh, we, we, I was going to use the Power by Max uh, front and rear steering kits that are made for drifting uh, just to keep things simple or keep that off of our design plate. Mm -hmm and um, Kibbe Tech modeled that and put that into the CAD software to, to build the chassis around as well. 
Now, in terms of that CAD software, that's the next thing I want to jump into. Obviously, we've seen uh, the technology advance in the way that we design and build project cars, even at a grassroots level and certainly at the level you're working at. So this was completely modelled in CAD before a single component was cut, bent or, or welded? We, yeah, I'd say probably 85% of everything was modelled on the truck before, or in the computer before we uh, started getting to work on it. And I wish that we were able to go <laughs> the last percent of that because then everything would have been a zero headache situation. Not that there was a ton, but there's always gonna be those little things if you don't follow through with every single detail. And the problem with that is we just couldn't get some of the parts that we wanted in time to really push the project along. So we weren't, we weren't gonna uh, sit back and wait for, say, um, uh, just something simple for another month where the chassis needed to go get manufactured. Yeah, particularly uh, when you're building these things under a time crunch, which obviously you always are, that, that's a factor that needs to be considered. So a, a little bit compromised potentially in terms of the full potential of, of doing all of that modeling. In terms of the actual construction though, once they've got that, that uh, 3D model of all of the, the tube frame, is it then a case of manually cutting and bending the, the individual components or is that all CNC bend, laser cut, so it's just a a cut set to, to weld together? Yeah, I mean, you could do it yourself and, and uh, measure everything. You could bend it all manually and just make sure all the uh, everything was bent properly. But what we did is had, uh, since I have a relationship with uh, Rob Parsons, also known as Chair Slayer, he has a new company called Bending Solutions and he has also a CNC tubing bender and uh, laser, laser notching machine. So we had everything uh, um, finalized by Kibbe Tech and then they sent it off to Rob to just be uh, uploaded into his machine. Obviously, it's not that simple, but <laughs> for, for simplicity's sake, yeah, he, he, he got everything manufactured on all his CNC machines. So everything was within a very tight spec when it came back for assembly. In, in terms of time saving, because this is one we sort of have to weigh up. Obviously, the, you need someone, first of all, capable of working with SolidWorks or uh, Fusion 360 to yep. do the modeling, that's a given. But even then, there's, there's a time involved in modeling everything and then playing with the design, making iterations of changes. And then when it comes to the actual construction, when you're happy with that, obviously that goes relatively quickly with the CNC bending and cutting, etc. Yep. Uh, in terms of the time to do it using 3D modeling versus the old fashioned way of some hand drawings and then just feeling it out and throwing it all together and figuring out what doesn't work, which is quicker, which is slower? Man. Or, or do we get a, a similar uh, result in terms of time taken, but a better result because it's modeled? I think you get a similar result. If you're, if, not, if you're not winging it, but you have a plan and you're doing everything manually, you're working every day on like this and that, like kind of tackling it bit by bit, bit by bit. But when you're doing the modeling, you have a way better plan a way better idea of how things are going to fit and go together and uh, hopefully the execution is better. Yeah. I mean I think one of the advantages as I'd said is you know, if you've modeled everything properly you're going to know through suspension, full travel, bump and droop, the, exactly. the steering movement, you're not going to have it hit body work or hit other components and that is somewhat awkward to find out if you're building it and then you find out once you've actually constructed everything. It's going to, it's going to help you with the later process of um, getting the car on track and working through any potential issues that you have. Definitely. Yeah. All right, let's talk about what's actually powering it and, and the drivetrain. Give, give us the rundown. What's the engine for a start? So the engine is a 3S GTE variation. So we, there's a block called a 5SFE. It's the same family as a 3S, but uh, it was made uh, as a 2.2 liter. So we're running that block because it's a stronger casting. Uh, so we're running a 3S GTE crank. It's not the stroker crank and uh, it has an 87 millimeter bore, so it's probably like a 2.1 liter, 10 to one compression. Uh, we're also running an NA Generation 1 uh, 3S head, which came on like an 86, 87 Toyota Celica. Big ports, uh, flows really well, all mechanical, no VVTi, uh, good set of camshaft spec for drifting, so pretty mild on, uh, on duration and lifts. And then um, we're gonna run a GTX Garrett 770 and probably make about 600 to 650 um, at the wheels. 
because this is an exhibition or demo right. car, you, you're not actually in competition with anyone. Does that take a little bit of the pressure off in terms of not trying to have to make a thousand horsepower to be competitive? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we uh, th so the engine will be capable of a thousand. That's the engine builder that I went to uh, drag races these engines and his programs. Uh, rev to like 10,500 on the valve train and make over a thousand wheel horsepower. So I told him, I was like, just build it to your spec. I'm going to run it at 600, hopefully get three or three seasons out of it and, and be ready to rock. So it should last forever, right? Yeah. I mean, we're only going to be running 275 size tire on the back. So there's no point in running a thousand horsepower. It's just going to blow the tires off anyways. I'm assuming with the tube frame, other than the fact you've got the, the fuel cell right at the rear, probably not a lot of weight on the, the rear of the, the chassis as well. We haven't weighed it yet, uh, but I want to say it's going to be pretty dang light. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think under 2000 pounds light, but it should be pretty, pretty damn light. All right. Let's uh, talk about the rest of the drivetrain uh, gearbox. Uh, your boy is Hollinger RD6, six speed sequential. Um, Transmission that I have, I've run uh, for years, love it, and um, pumped to have it in this chassis as well. Pretty bulletproof and definitely at the sort of power level you're, you're talking about. Yeah. Moving back to the rear, winter's quick change, I assume? Pretty standard, winter's quick change. Uh, yeah, I mean, I drive shaft shop axles, uh, carbon drive shaft shop, drive shaft, and um, that's kind of the winning formula for, uh, for kind of a pro level drift car. Uh, now, it's finished, but it's not quite finished. Uh, right. Still a, a few little jobs to go. I uh, understand some of that's the electronics and wiring. So tell us what's going to be actually running this, this engine. Yeah, all my uh, M, uh, sorry, Motec M150 ECU, PDM30, uh, and then a C1212, or do you say 1212 display? 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we, we're picking up what you're putting down. Yep. And uh, my, my crew chief, Brian Hartsock, will be doing all the wiring on it. And then uh, John Reed will be doing all the tuning on the engine. So when do you actually envisage it to be uh, shredding some tires for the first time in anger? I'm hoping uh, mid-January we'll have it wrapped up and ready to go, yeah. All right, one last element we can't really not talk about, which is the, the body kit. And, and I watched a really interesting uh, video on your YouTube channel about how that was created, but sort of let, let's go over that. How did that process go? So I asked uh, John Sabal to do the body kit or the design for the truck. Um, I've been a fan of his for years, looking at his uh, Instagram posts and uh, just the work that he does is uh, very al uh, along the lines of what I want a race car to look like or a drift truck or whatever the case is. And so I wanted him to do it. My first time working with him is super, super professional and very easy to work with. So what I did is just take a bunch of pictures I found on Google of cars that I am a personal fan of and send it to him as inspiration. I said, I want these few specific things and then you just do your thing. Uh, so I gave him a lot of freedom besides a couple of design um, aesthetics and he came back and this was the design. I didn't change one thing. He na you nailed it, it out of the park. Yeah. I mean, I must say it really does fit with the, the style of the original truck. It, you know, there's so many times you see a body kit clearly plastered on the top of a car and it just doesn't quite right. gel with the original. This really does feel like it, it's meant to be. And now, like we talked about the technology advances with the chassis design and, and, and fabrication, that sort of really comes into John's work as well and that is no longer sort of gluing blocks of foam and, and, yeah. and sanding. So what, what's he actually do to create this? It's all digital? So John, yeah, John, I couldn't even tell you right now, but John uses multiple different uh, design softwares to design something like this. And then he, those files need to get converted by somebody so that they can go to, you know, get built into CAD. So they need to be sized properly and converted. And then I was able to have those sent off to ADV fiberglass here, in, or not here, but in, um, in Southern California. And then they CNC'd the molds on their five axis router and uh, made them perfect. I mean, that's why these, the body kit is perfect from the rendering that we that we got from John's design just because everything was CNC'd in, in the computer. I guess the advantage there as well you've got molds so if you damage anything it's Correct. just a case of making another product off that original mold. Yeah I don't I don't I have the molds and I haven't made anything very complex as far as composites are concerned so I'm hoping I keep it pretty decent for a while and give myself give myself some time to learn to, to make some some spares. Yeah, that'd, that'd probably be nice yeah. with a brand new build. <laughs> Look, Ryan, great to get some insight into to the car and, and great to see it here, at least 99% uh, finished. And we'll look forward to seeing it actually shredding on some uh, videos in the not too distant future, Abs I imagine. Absolutely, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks.
If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.